Dean in the Development Division and as well as Associate Director of the Center for Gut Microbiota Research, the Chinese University of Hong Kong in Hong Kong. She is also the Director of a new Microbiota Innovation Center at Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Her main interests or research interests include inflammatory bowel disease and gut microbiota. She has published over 200 articles in Nature Genetics, Nature Communication, Lancets, Gastroenterology and Gut. So today she's going to talk to us on IBD Undone, Changing the Critical Cost of Mild Moderate Ulcerative Colitis Patient. Over to you, Professor Ng Siu Chen. Thank you very much, um, Alex. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you first for this kind invitation and the introduction. I really am delighted for um, our sponsor, Faring, to continue excellence in education and in pursuing PBD's um, care, even in the unprecedented times of COVID-19. So it's really nice to have a sort of change and to carry on treating and managing our patients better. So today I'm going to share with you how we really think about changing the clinical course of um, ulcer colitis. I think I always think that ulcer colitis is like an orphan child because a lot of focus has been in Crohn's disease uh, for many years because of new drugs and sort of understanding of the timeline and milestone. But right now, I think it's time to think about how we could sort of um, change the natural course or clinical course of patients with ulcer colitis. So what really has changed? I think there are three key things that have changed. One is increasing burden. We have to manage more patients. Second, which I focus a lot on, is just moving and evolving treatment targets. And of course, we have the luxury of newer and more effective drugs. And one day, hopefully, we'll be able to have predictive markers to think about who are the ones who have more successful outcome. So I always thought, wouldn't it be great if there's a drug for every problem? We can choose the right drug for the right person at the right time, the right dose, the right duration, and at the same time, get complete disease remission, mucosal healing, and even histologic healing without any side effects. Now, this depends on what kind of person you are. I mean, if you are someone who thinks about looking at this glass half you know, in some way empty, then you may think this is actually pretty um, impossible. But looking at this glass half full, I think it's possible. So one of the biggest challenges we have to face now is this increasing disease um, burden. So for example, right here, we have this population-based study published in The Lancet two years ago. And it shows us that in Asia, in newly industrialized countries, in Africa, in South America, the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease, including ulcer colitis, is rising rapidly. And in fact, this was what we designed about more than five years ago to look at how many people in Asia within across different countries, this was only 12 countries at that time, had you know, an incidence of ulcer colitis and Crohn's disease. And you could see it varies across the Asian region. And right now, there were only 12 countries with that cohort. And with the funding support recently, we're delighted that one day we will be able to color this map completely. If you look at this map, which is published recently online, it's over a 20-year period, the incidence of ulcer colitis. If you look at the gray area here, these are many parts of where we are now in this region in Asia. In fact, the incidence is still unknown. And I think in a couple of years time, we will see a colorful map knowing the burden and the number of patients we have to treat in this part of the world. And this will be important in informing healthcare policies. So the 20th century IBD management is reactive. In other words, if you look here, what happens is when a patient has a flare, they go to see the doctor, we treat them, they go into remission. Then they have the next flag. And then they see the doctor, they get better, and they have another flag. This is what it used to be. And that patient could have easily three to four flags a year. If I take you through to the 21st century, we are moving towards proactive care. Essentially meaning we want to do extensive, intensive monitoring, adjusting to predefine objective target. And what you see here is, the aim is really to reduce the number of flares in these patients from maybe three to two to one to zero. 
and reduce hospitalizations and improve quality of care. So patient reported outcome is also increasingly important. So if we take a look at the traditional treatment goals in ulcer colitis, why was it not sufficient? We used to minimize symptoms and we have as doctors been thought that we need to treat the patients. We shouldn't be treating the laboratory test or the endoscopy findings, but I will show you why this is going to change. And in the past, we do progressive stepwise treatment intensification, and we evaluate patients based on what they tell us. But right now, we are moving into a new era, whereby we now know that apart from stratifying the patients at baseline, we have many patients that just do not meet the target of what we call mucosal healing. And these are the patients who probably need continued therapy and target surveillance. So one example here is your optimal target. You could see here, it used to be symptoms. In fact, quality of life have only recently appeared on patient reported outcomes. But if you look here, laboratory, biology, which is deep remission and mucosal healing, these have become some of the key targets as well. So a new trip to target approach with increased monitoring and tight control will be very much needed. So you may not need to necessarily vote, but I just want you to think in your head this question. Ask yourself, how often do you reach your treatment target in your patient with ulcer colitis? Is it most of the time? Is it half the time? Is it sometimes? Is it rarely? Or I don't really know what my target is. I hope you will be answering number five after um, this um, talk. And I can tell you, at least for me, I mean, I don't think it will be 100%. In fact, it's only about half or so most of the time. And I'll show you uh, why that's the case later. Now, if you want to achieve more complete mucosal healing as an optimal UC treatment goal, we need to know what really is the evidence supporting this. The first line of evidence is if you have a patient with ulcer colitis and they tell you they are well and you do an endoscope and you find these four different scenarios, will you do something different if they have no symptoms and they're completely in clinical remission? So you could see someone with endoscopic remission. You could see this top right-hand corner with severe ulcerations. And another patient here with a lot of scarring, probably from very severe inflammation many years ago. And this is somebody who had dysplasia before and now having chromoendoscopy. And I can tell you the target for every single patient right here is going to be different, even though all of them are in clinical remission. So in the least top right-hand corner, we are not going to just leave the patient without any therapy or escalation of therapy. And we really have a problem. The problem we have is that up to 50% of UC patients who are in clinical remission will still have endoscopic evidence of active disease. So we have to be aware of this fact. And this has been shown in several studies. And despite that, a high prevalence of clinical symptoms has been noted in patients who have achieved mucosal healing. So as doctors, these patients may not necessarily have UC-related disease. They may have superimposed bacterial overgrowth or irritable bowel syndrome. So over-treating them may not be a good idea. Essentially, under-treatment or over-treatment in relation to symptoms and disease activity endoscopy continues to be an unmet need. And this is where with the personalized approach that we need to take. So mucosal is healing is good for ulcer colitis. And if you don't remember much from the data, there are three types of studies. One is that patients who achieve mucosal healing are more likely to be in remission up to one year. They are more likely to not need a colectomy, and they are also more likely to have corticoid steroid-free clinical remission. And here is one um, other example. Mucosal healing is even better because it is associated with a lower risk of colorectal neoplasia. So, for example, histologic inflammation in patients with ulcer colitis is associated with a risk of colorectal cancer, and histologic healing can prevent clinical recurrence, reduce steroid use, and lower the hospitalization. So here is the ad study where ulcer colitis patients were treated with an anti-TNF in fiximab in this case. And you could see, if you just look at the blue line, these are patients who have achieved mucosal healing with an endoscopy subscore of zero, or those with only one, the orange line. And these are the patients who have a higher likelihood to remain colectomy free. So 
by achieving mucosal healing, you can reduce the risk of having surgery. Secondly, it is leading to better long-term outcome. Here are elegant population-based studies looking at the proportion of patients who still do not need surgery who have achieved mucosal healing, again demonstrated by the blue line. Now, in the STRIPE study, which was uh, concentrated on ulcer colitis, this was published close to uh, five years ago now, and I think there will be a new STRIPE um, um, up and coming. And you can see the patient reported outcomes, the two important key features for ulcer colitis, this is slightly different for patients with Crohn's disease, are two things. Resolution of rectal bleeding. We want rectal bleeding to stop quickly and also you know, a more proportion of patients to have no rectal bleeding and normalization of bowel habits. And secondly, resolution of symptoms alone is not sufficient target anymore. And it would seem that a Mayo endoscopy subscore of one, it doesn't say zero, I mean here, one should be a minimum target, so a minimum. And the optimal target will clearly be the absence of ulcerations, which is a male endoscopy subscore of symptom zero. And then we should then reassess these patients probably six months later after starting treatment. So now we talk about mucosal healing, which we focus on endoscopic remission. What about histologic remission? Is this better than mucosal healing on itself? Here are the patients that you may see on endoscopy. So on the top bar, you have someone with a normal endoscopy. You have someone with mild inflammation, moderate and severe. And the question is, how many of you actually, after doing an endoscopy, take routine biopsies to, ask, um, to assess for histologic healing? So I generally will take a biopsy from each segment, even though the patient is has no endoscopic activity at all. Clearly, you could see despite normal endoscopies, some patients may still have histology findings of crib distortion, basal plasma cytosis, or epithelial metaplasia. Now, why is this important? In fact, in the last, I think, three or four years, there are more data to show that histopathology can predict ulcer colitis remission and even reducing their rate of hospitalization or needing steroids. And another sort of separate study is a varsity trial. This is looking at the delizumab, one of the you know, um, only head-to-head -head comparison of two uh, biological drugs. In this scenario, it was Dino versus Adalimumab, looking at the patients who can achieve you know, histologic um, remission. And you could see here, at least in this um, scenario, the red one, in those who had delizumab, many actually uh, achieved a substantial proportion uh, at one year had less histologic activity. And one of the important things is also therapeutic drug monitoring. In this scenario, you could see how with personalized you know, treatment, in patients with higher drug level, they are more likely to have mucosal healing. And I'll briefly mention about monitoring in a little while. Now, in a unified search study, patients were um, randomized to either acetinimab or placebo, and the rate doctor line here, I'd like to highlight, you could see that the patients who had drug, active drug compared to placebo, in fact, a larger proportion actually achieved mucosal healing. In this scenario, endoscopic sort of improvement than those who receive placebo. And the new oral jet kinase inhibitor, the one of the first you know, oral you know, molecule for ulcer colitis, the octave study, look at patients in sort of week 52 who achieve mucosal healing. And right here, you could see there's a difference. Again, a larger proportion, at least one third in the patients who receive the active drug, the TOFA, who achieve mucosal healing compared to those in their placebo arm. So to summarize that, for remission, I think in any studies, I've shown you a few examples. There are many, many more which can be covered in just this talk. But the message is, from inception cohort, from natural history study, from clinical trials, the more complete the remission, either clinical, endoscopy, histology, immune, biomarker, the better the long-term outcome. The big news is what are the things we can use to achieve this remission better and more quickly? So for mesalazine, I think in the last decade, we are very fortunate we now have mesalazine with higher 5-ASA content per dose, which means patients need less tablets with better compliance. We have once-per-day tablet, which means patients have to take the drug less often, so better compliance. 
with newer formulations, which means better release into the part of the gut that we need. And more use of 5-ASA in UC means less sterile use and less adverse effects. So one of the important things in my clinical practice is that you see that we generally now combine oral and rectal 5-ASA. So there are two sort of important studies. This is one focusing on distal ulcer colitis. In fact, even the distal active colitis, you could see a very old study. But when you do the combination of rectal and oral 5-ASA, there was a rate bar. It's a combination bar. The patients without rectal bleeding, if you remember, one of the reported outcomes in ulcer colitis is more rapid resolution of PR bleeding and um, for higher proportion who did not have rectal bleeding. This was achieved better in the combination arm. And even a more recent study, which is an important, elegant study, the PING study. The PING study, again, randomized patients to either combination therapy of 5-ASA, 4 gram with 5-ASA enema, or just 5-ASA oral, the placebo enema. And you could see here in this arm, the patients who actually have the combination therapy actually do much better. In fact, they only not do better, but they also have a larger proportion of patients who have reduction in their rectal bleeding. So it's important to remember that in patients with distal active colitis, extensive or pancolitis, combination therapy is superior to monotherapy combination, meaning in this scenario, a rectal 5-ASA and an oral 5-ASA together at high dose to get them well quickly. So the current role of 5-ASA in ulcer colitis, I would say, the proctitis and left-sided, uh, rectal 5-ASA, this has been shown in several meta-analysis, is better than rectal steroids. And for extensive or total colitis, oral and rectal 5-ASA is again superior to either alone. And these treatments are sort of unsafe as well as effective. So adherence is always a big I mean, issue asking patients like IBD to take um, chronic lifelong um, treatment. Now, this is Sananda King's you know, very elegant work and one of the best, I mean, earlier work, looking at increased risk of relapse in patients not adhering to mesalazine. It is really clear. You can see this drop really, really rapidly and dramatically in patients who do not continue to take their drug. And the type of patients who are non-adherent is quite clear. Uh, those who are in full employment, those who have quiescent disease, if you have to take three times daily dosing, I think if you, patients are still treating, taking three times daily or 5 ASC, I would call them like dinosaurs. Those are ancient times. We are now in a new era where once daily dosing is just as effective as, you know, twice or three times daily. Or those, of course, who have psychological problems or multiple dosing males and who are single, these are poor prognostic factors for non-compliance. But if we want to really achieve our target, how do we actually do that? Do we have the tools to help us I mean, with that? Now, there are a few biomarkers that are clearly important and widely available. CRP, fecal calprotectin, drug levels, and of course, as gastroenterologists or surgeons, and endoscope, or even in combination of all of the above. If we take a look at CRP, in fact, it has quite low sensitivity or a correlation with endoscopic activity in ulcer colitis. If you look at the systematic review, over 5,400 studies, of which 19 were included in this analysis, in fact, CRP has a sensitivity of not even close to 0.5 and, um, in order to sort of, um, achieve detection of endoscopic activity. In contrast, calprotectin is sensitive and specific. And it's a very good surrogate marker, not only for endoscopic activity, but surprisingly also for histologic activity. You can see here for histologic activity, this is a work from a Joyce map from the center. In fact, with a fecal cow protecting at 200 or less, it has a sensitivity of 71 and still 80% for histologic activity. So um, a few years ago, uh, together with our friends from Asia, we published um, this study looking at, actually, in our patients in Asia, in the first year of diagnosis of ulcer colitis, how many actually really have mucosal healing? Well, only less than 50%. So we are actually not doing so good. But I think these were you know, published a couple of years ago. And I'm sure if we repeat this study again, we're going to find a higher rate. So in this study, a raised ESL predict less likelihood of mucosal healing at diagnosis. 
And uh, our work has been also um, group has been looking at fecal immunochemical test, which we know is a test used to screen colorectal cancer. Uh, it's a cheap test. Uh, so in centers where there's no fecal calprotectin available, which hopefully is quite rare. Uh, in fact, in this study published in JCC, we found that the diagnostic accuracy of fit uh, was compared to fecal calprotectin and was relatively um, comparable in this um, sense. That combining both of them could achieve even a higher percentage of detection or um, endoscopy activity. So one of the, um, my favorite study is this one published uh, by Osterman in the USA. And that is how we can use our understanding of personalized and intensification of treatment to help reach our target. So in this study, all patients with ulcer colitis were clinically well, but they have increased fecal calprotectin. So what the authors did was they increased the dose of mesalis into 4.8 grams. Some may be only on 2 gram or 2.4 gram uh, who had increased fecal calprotectin. And look at what happened. By doing this escalation of treatment dose, a large majority of patients had reduction in the fecal calprotectin, but more importantly, they had a lower rate of relapse over the next year or so. So this is where we need to meet our target of using biomarker to improve outcome of patients. So, I have to declare I love therapeutic drug monitoring because it allows me to have a very personalized approach to my patient in my clinical practice. And one other example is if you have access to therapeutic drug monitoring like in Fixamab level. In this study, they found that over 100 patients treated with three induction doses of Infliximab who then received scheduled Infliximab for ulcer colitis. You can see a detectable drop in Infliximab level could actually predict remission, endoscopic response, and even a lower risk of colectomy. So we are able to preempt a very proactive approach rather than waiting for the patient to relapse and you know do less well, then only we escalate sort of treatment in this sense. So that I want to show you two studies hot from the press. And many of us know we were not able to be at TDW this year, but there were two related mesalazine sort of studies. Uh, in the DDW uh, 2020. Now, this first one is uh, a post hoc analysis of four randomized controlled trials. And they look at active ulcer colitis patients who are treated with three types of doses of mesalazine 1.5 gram, 3 gram, or 4.5 gram. And you could see here that actually the high dose means at least so, 3 gram of mesalazine had a higher rate of histology and endoscopic mucosal healing when they compare it with a lower dose, which is 1.5 gram. So generally in my practice, I would definitely use at least a minimum of two or even actually three gram. Following this, if you want to achieve a higher rate of histology and endoscopic mucosal healing. Now, the second study which relates to our clinical practice a lot is that there are a small proportion of patients who are intolerant of ulcer colitis for whatever sort of reasons. Now, this multi-center retrospective study looked at 600 over patients, and they found that 11%, so one out of 10, will not be able to tolerate mesalazine, and it's even diarrhea, fever, abdominal pain, and the risk factors are those women and those with younger age. But listen to this. It's interesting that if you would challenge them, actually over 50%, up to 64%, with different formulations, more than half can still tolerate it. So there's still a role in these patients and not to give up too quickly. So this is the one of the summary to look at changing UC targets in the 21st century. If you look at the blue, which is what we used to do, but now we are moving towards the red in some patients, mucosal healing, deep remission, treating early enough or even escalating therapy when we need to, and also patient reported outcomes. What is it that matters to them? Quality of life, you know, rectal bleeding, fatigue. I think many of these will be incorporated in our goal over time. So in summary, uh, the treatment target of IBD, especially arthritis, is evolving and has changed. We now know that mucosal healing, the deeper we can achieve, Actually, the better it is, is a treatment target. The reason is it's associated with better clinical outcome, lower risk of surgery, and histologic remission, although right now it's not the current treatment goal yet, but we now are seeing more data to support its role. So over time, our histopathologies may get busier, whereby we may use that as a marker, or we may need to find some good markers for histologic remission, like fecal carpotactic. Type monitoring results in better outcome, and certainly, be 
basically trying to be more aggressive in patients with ulcerative colitis. This is so extensive. We have active disease. The combination of oral and animal 5 ASA in combination is safe, is effective, and is very well accepted in patients. Thank you very much, and I welcome any questions later on. Thank you very much, uh, Sue, for that extensive uh, and very uh, full of uh, yeah, information lecture just now. Uh, we will keep the answer, question and answer session towards the end of the session. And uh, you all can post your question in the Q&A segment at the bottom of your platform. And we would love to actually answer uh, uh, all of them later yeah, after we completed the uh, session. Uh, next, we will proceed to the next uh, lecture, which is going to be given to us by the Professor Chi Hua Ran. Uh, Professor Chi Hua Ran is a professor of medicine, chief uh, physician of uh, gastroenterology, and associate director at Renqi uh, Hospital, Shanghai, Jia Tong University School of uh, Medicine. He is also the president of uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, and South Africa IBD Consortium, and the director at the Shanghai IBD Research. Center. His main interest uh, in research is uh, include molecular biology and clinical research of autoimmunity and inflammatory bowel diseases. He has published numerous publications in journals and uh, international uh, reputable journals. Uh, Professor Zhu Huaran is going to talk to us on treat to target the evolving paradigm in the management of ulcerative colitis. Over to you, uh, Professor Ran. Thank you, thanks. Uh, uh, Alex, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be invited to join this afternoon uh, our webinar seminar. So I'm going to talk about the treat to target the involving paradigm in the treatment of uh, management of us. Both you have to arm yourselves. Uh, yes, how to control? Professor, you can do the next uh, the next slide just using your laptop. You can do words. Uh, I, I I cannot, you know, control. So, uh, how to move on? Prof. Ram, I think you can click on the slide itself once, and then you can press the next button. You just click, yeah, on the arrow, click on that. Okay, yeah. No, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. So, are we back? No, no. All right, excuse me, yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, we know that uh, ulcerative colitis is a chronic, relapsing, and disabling uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And the growing evidence indicates that ulcerative colitis should be considered a progressive disease, exactly as Crohn's disease, having the same tendency to progress to irreversible structural damage and aggressive cause hospitalization rates, progression in extension and relapse rate, as well as colectomy, dysplasia, or cancer occurrence are the main challenges for dedicated uh, physicians. Yeah, currently medications including, sorry, um, I cannot control. Okay, the current medications including our five, uh, five emphysitis, steroids, immunosuppressants, biologics, and small molecules. In principle, there are two therapeutical approaches which are recommended, the top-down strategies and step-up strategies. 
top down strategies means uh, um, uh, was uh, initially used, combined use by logics uh, or in the suppression in those patients with, you know, uh, risk of factors uh, aiming at a slow down the disease progression and the long term disease uh, prevention. So, uh, based on current evidence, risk of stratification for osteoarthritis patients or that patients with limited anatomic accident might endoscopic disease uh, were regarded as a lower risk of disease progression. Those patients with age uh, younger than 40, extensive colitis, with deep ulcerations, high uh, CRT as well as uh, ESR rate, and still were requiring disease, history of hospitalization, cross to different type or CNE infections were considered as high risk. A top-down strategies is recommended to those patients aiming at to control the inflammation and prevent disease uh, progressions. So the uh, recent in recent years, the concept of treat to target in implemented bowel disease has been proposed. The aim of the T2T is to avoid development of serious complications and disability in patients with chronic conditions. Well, the concept is that treating to a predefined treatment target that is associated with optimal long-term outcomes. The strategies will be ongoing and regular monitoring of the targets and all uh, surrogate markers with optimization of treatment when the target is not met. The additional principles involved the targets treatment and monitoring are tailored to the needs of the individual patients. Uh, uh, there are two key components. One, the first one uh, is a T2T approach involves uh, predefining a treatment target in concern pa patients with the patient. And the secondary are uh, continuous monitoring this activity and modifying treatment until the target is, is reached. Well, in, in the year of 2015, the IOIBD Stride Committee defined the treat-to-target approach for implemented bowel disease, which shifted the goal of associated crisis treatment to long-term prevention of disease complications and proposed the monitoring of objective disease activity measurements, including clinical, endoscopical, histological, imaging, biomarkers, and patient report outcomes. Well, all the recommended targets in aspirative colitis by IOIBD was a composite endpoint, including both clinical or patients reported outcome remission and endoscopic remissions. Well, there are uh, different definitions of, of remissions according to different, you know, uh, indices. For example, in patients with aspirative colitis, the clinical remission is defined, simplified uh, clinical uh, clinical uh, uh, activity index equal or less than four, and for endoscopic remission, it was defined male endoscopic uh, uh, subscore zero or or one. So the surgical goals had shifted from clinical inf improvement. Uh, clinical remission, which was proposed at the year of 1965, and the scopic remission proposed at the year of 2011 to histological remission in this year. The histological grading of the, this activity has promised as an outcome measure in clinical trials of therapy in aspiratory colitis and as a prognostic marker in practice could represent the ultimate therapeutic goal in aspirative colitis, as she uh, had mentioned in her talk. Yeah, uh, however, the correlation between patients report outcomes, the clinical incidence uh, indices, endoscopic and histologic histo uh, histology is poor in several studies. In patients with clinical active disease, for instance, uh, around 15% patients 
may be in endoscopic remission, and 20 may be in uh, histological remission, uh, while uh, in patients with histologically active disease, 34% uh, um, in clinical remission, and 25 in endoscopic uh, remission. So the actual symptoms are no, uh, not reliable indicator of mucosal healing in ulcerative colitis. The relationship of rapid breathing and a still frequency with mucosal healing and the quality of life in patients with ulcerative colitis in two phase three studies, H1 and H2, were investigated among patients with an ascopic subscore uh, to zero at week eight. Uh, 87% reported no rapid breathing, while only 29% reported normal stew frequency. The absence of rapid breathing and a normal stew frequency are often predictive of mucosal healing and quality of life, but complete normalization of stew uh, frequency is encountered rarely in patients with mucosal healing. Well, the lower and subscores at week 8 were associated with increased rates of mucosal healing at week uh, 13 and sustained mucosal healing at both weeks uh, 13 and 54 in infraxmap treated patients, indicating early mucosal healing, for instance, a week 8 and a scope, uh, subscore of 0 were most likely to achieve substant mucosal healing. Well, despite important differences between endoscopic male scores 0 and 1, both scores are considered as mucosal healing in most important trials. The aim of the present studies was to evaluate the risk of relapse in ulcerative colitis patients according to the degree of mucosal healing uh, uh, and either endoscopic male scores of 0 and 1. In this uh, prospective longitudinal cohort study, a total of 100, 187 consecutive ulcerative colitis patients were recorded. The relapse rate at 6 months were 9.4% uh, in male 0 versus 36.6 in male subscore uh, of 1. So patients with an endoscopic male score of 1 have a higher risk of relapse than those with a score of 0. The concept of mucosal healing should be limited to patients with an endoscopic male a score of 0. So uh, those are the sample and endoscopic imaging of uh, asymmetric colitis, including both uh, male score uh, male score and uh, asymmetric colitis, and endoscopic index of severity, which was proposed uh, several years ago by uh, Simon uh, Travers. The in asymmetric colitis uh, uh, index of uh, uh, severity, there are three descriptors including uh, vascular patterns, breathing, erosion assholes with a range of 0 to 2 or 0 to 3 scales, uh, respectively. So actually, uh, in recent years, so the, uh, uh, the UCERS had been verified in clinical setting. The accuracy of UCERS and male uh, endoscopic scores for evaluating aspirated colitis severity and outcomes in patients with aspirated colitis was compared in these studies. Um, patients, uh, you see patients received tigrolimus, a uh, total of number was 41. The mean UCERS improved from, uh, uh, dramatically and based on the UCERS, a significant reduction was reached in both the response and remission group. In contrast, the male uh, uh, endoscopic scores did not reflect a significant change in response group, uh, indicating the UCEIS uh, more accurate, uh, accurately reflects the clinical outcomes and the long-term prognosis than the male endoscopic scores. So, um, 
So uh, recently, a new end, uh, end point for clinic, uh, aspiratory paralysis treatment, so-called HESTO, and scope mucosal healing has been proposed. Uh, it combined uh, the endoscopic healing by endoscopic examination as well as histological healing at the several levels by histological examination. Uh, histological healing was defined as neutral free infiltration in less than 5% of crabs and no crabs destruction and no erosions, ulcerations or uh, gran uh, granulations tissues. So um, the proposed aspirative cryotic tree to target aggression was uh, listed in these figures. Uh, at initial diagnosis, uh, you have to perform the assessment of the disease uh, for the disease severity and uh, evaluation of the risk, uh, risk of fibrations and uh, se select uh, therapy and uh, targets accordingly. For patients with active disease, you have to mention, uh, uh, you have to measure, assess the symptoms every uh, uh, endoscopic uh, uh, assessment every three to six months. Um, and for those patients who are uh, in remission, uh, the assessment can be done every six to 12 months. The assessment may include other clinical symptoms, mucosal healing, or adjuv uh, adjuvant biomarkers. If patients achieved the, the targets, you can continue the current treatment. If failed to, uh, to, to reach the targets, the very important step is reassessment of the uh, severity and adjust your uh, cerebral region. This is a very important uh, uh, adjustment. So what are the lessons learned, particularly learned from Crohn's studies clinical trials there are three, you know, the first one is uh, clinician uptakes, the early aggressive therapy and tight monitoring of the disease cause. And uh, first, the clinical, uh, the clinician uptakes uh, of the treated target concept. Well, uh, um, so, uh, uh, the end of the study was to uh, evaluate the extent to which proposed targets are achieved in real-world uh, care. Uh, this is a motor center retrospective cross-sectional uh, uh, study conducted in uh, Australia of 246 patients with hospitalities and 61% uh, were in clinical remission and uh, 35 percent patients in clinical, uh, both in clinical and endoscopic remission. So 57 percent reached male endoscopic remission, or uh, either male endoscopic score zero or one. Of them, only uh, uh, four, uh, 46 percent achieved histological remission. So conclusion from this study is most the patients with aspirative gliders do not achieve com composite clinical and endoscopic endoscopic remission in real-world practice. Clinching uh, uptake of proposed to the treat to target guidelines is a challenge to their implement uh, uh, patients. Well, uh, uh, recently a survey of treatment strategies was conducted among Portuguese doctors uh, regarding the concept of uh, treat to target because treat to target was proposed at the year of uh, 2015, and initially the uptake was lower, but after several, several, uh, several years later, the uptake was increased. You know, in this service, uh, uh, um, uh, Portuguese doctors regarding, you know, uh, uh, the deep remission was considered the main treatment goal for ulcerative colitis by 83.9% uh, uh, of Participants and mucosal of healing as a uh, uh, treatment target by uh, was used by uh, uh, about 95 percent uh, of participants in aspiratory crisis. So, conclusion from these studies uh, is that a treatment target strategy to achieve mucosal of healing and a deeper remission is currently accepted by uh, uh, a substantial number of Portuguese. Gastroenterologist, I think a similar pattern uh, were, uh, in uh, North uh, uh, North America and uh, Europe. And second one is the uh, uh, early aggressive 
on our solar page. So early intervention with biologics can slow the disease progression and improve long-term outcomes in IBD, particularly in Crohn's disease, reducing irreversible damage. This is attributable to absence of window of opportunity uh, for intervention before intervention and eventually uh, bowel damage become established. Considering the inadequate control of the inflammation burden and the current, with current treatment, it is uh, you know speculate that early intervention could prevent the disease progression in arthritic colitis. However, uh, currently there was no clear definition of early disease in arthritic colitis. No relevant benefit for patients with arthritic colitis treated with early biologic therapy and the retrospective study design, which is uh, limited by uh, indication bias. So the efficacy of anti-TNF in mild to moderate, uh, moderate arthritic colitis patients was average and compared based on the a stratification by time of first anti-TNF exposure. The early initiation was defined within three years of diagnosis. The primary outcomes was colectomy, colitis related hospitalization, and a clinical secondary uh, loss of response. You can see from the data, you can see the figures, you know, there was no differences could be observed between the treat, treated earlier and the later groups in terms of hospitalization rate, colorectomy rate, indicating that earlier treatment does not prevent the disease progression in ulcerative colitis. So in another, you know, uh, uh, study in uh, uh, video, you know, within six months of initiation of treatment with lendurizumab, significantly higher proportions of patients with early stage Crohn's disease versus later stage Crohn's disease achieved clinical remission, or still free uh, remission, and endoscopic remission. In contrast, um, disease duration was not a significant predictor of response among patients with arthritic colitis. So, Conclusion from this study is that this duration does not associate with response to fendorizumab in patients with ulcerative colitis. So uh, in, how about in uh, children and PDH uh, ulcerative colitis patients? This is a retrospective chart review that was performed uh, in uh, U.S. Um, so uh, patients, you know, uh, receive infect map uh, uh, from January 2005 to April 2012. Colectomy at one year was 55.6% uh, 15, uh, in those with a uh, short duration, short, uh, uh, short than 20 minutes, uh, compared with 25% uh, uh, duration longer than 20 minutes. So. So current data therefore suggests that this duration has no impact on anti-TNA uh, vendorizumab effectiveness in acerbitral colitis. And in, in fact, rest of therapeutic failure may be high in patients exposed to earlier biologic uh, treatment. Last week uh, was tight uh, uh, monitoring of the disease cause. Well, in these studies, uh, a total of 91 ulcerative colitis patients in remission were randomized to intervention group. Monthly uh, analysis of fecal care protecting was performed, and a cut of variable uh, 300 milligram per gram was set as uh, was set for interventions. You can see active intervention significantly reduced the relapse rate, uh, which was 28.6% uh, in intervention group. Uh, versus, you know, uh, as high as 57% uh, uh, in control growth. So uh, recently, uh, a concept of treat tar target, as I had mentioned, has been proposed five years uh, five years ago. It was defined as deep prevention as composite endpoint. And in this year, uh, a new concept 
uh, termed to to clear, which was defined uh, the disappearance of any measurable uh, sign of information, including clinical remission and scopic uh, remission, as well as histological remission, had been proposed. This is a very new concept. Well, the impact of histological and endoscopic prevention on clinical recurrence and, uh, 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 and recurrence free time was investigated in these studies. Uh, male uh, endoscopic subscore uh, equal to 1 was observed in 46.7% and histological activity in 36.3%. Uh, 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 male endoscopic subscores uh, 1 and histological activity was significantly associated uh, with recurrence. Of this, only histological activity was an independent predictive factor of recurrence. Only a, a histological activity was a uh, uh, predictive uh, uh, factor for recurrence. So uh, this is another, you know, examples if patients achieve histological uh, uh, remission, uh, it could protect uh, the uh, uh, long term, you know, uh, six years uh, when you follow up uh, those uh, arthritic patients. That means that, uh, the importance of histological remission uh, uh, in clinical settings. So. Uh, again, this is uh, uh, this year's another study indicating among patients with arthritis in complete endoscopic remission, patients with uh, a complete histological normalizations were less likely uh, to experience relapse as compared with those without normalization by the uh, Gibbs scores. So, uh, the lack of a validated definition of early arthritis crisis and the lower uh, level of evidence from retrospective studies prevents definition uh, a defini uh, definitive conclusions. Large randomized prospective studies are needed to assess the efficacy of this strategy and to identify predictors of complicated disease in order to select the optimal candidates for early intervention. We should balance of benefit and risk ratio of early disease control. Finally, clinicians' awareness of changing uh, treatment uh, paradigm is fundamental. And you know, uh, recently we uh, the new concept disease clearance had been uh, proposed. Finally, I would like to conclude that as retrocrisis is a progressive disease over time, the treatment goals are constantly evolving in order to change the progressive course of implemented bowel disease. The clinicians are recommended to follow a target-driven approach, so called the treat-to-target. It's suspected that uh, early intervention could prevent the progression in arthritis. A new and more ambitious concept of this clearance treat-to-clear is emerging as potential target in the treatment of Arthritis. Thank you for your listening. It's all for my talk. Thanks much, Professor Ran Zhihua. I think there is a, this is a great talk that there is no other way uh, to sort of absorb and then uh, integrate what we have learned from previous lectures into a real case uh, presentation. So uh, for this, I would like to present uh, our, also our chairman to present uh, a real case of his own, uh, Professor Alex Liao who is a consultant and gastroenterologist at Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur, and also the faculty associate professor of the Department of Medicine at the University of Malaya. Yeah, so now, Professor Alex, you can uh, start to present the case. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alan, and thanks for the thanks for Professor Ran for that excellent lecture as well. Uh, we shall move on to the case discussion. Uh, I thought in order to make it more interactive and more exciting, I would like to invite the audience to uh, lock on to this uh, VVOX uh, voting and polling platform so that we can have a more uh, real-time discussion. And now I will invite the uh, Professor Ran as well as Professor Ng to join in to discuss this case as well. So in order to facilitate the uh, 
uh, voting session, uh, I will need you all to either scan the QR code by using your handphone or your tablet beside you, uh, or you can just go to vvox.app in your internet browser and just key in the meeting ID of 100 600 104. Uh, so again, I repeat again, you can either scan this QR code and it will bring you directly to your web browser for the voting session, or you can just go to vvox.app in your web browser and key in the meeting ID of uh, 100 600 and 104. So let me just move on to the first page of my presentation. So I'm going to present a case of a patient that I've been seeing since uh, 2017. Um, so whenever this patient come to me, she always asks me the same question again, doctor, why me? So it's a very challenging case in the treatment of ulcerative colitis, and I shall just move, uh, walk you all through the, uh, the whole course of uh, uh, progression as well as the, uh, the clinical history of this patient. So again, uh, just to reiterate again, uh, please uh, uh, start uh, involved. I mean, uh, in, uh, participate in the interactive session as well as the polling uh, of the question. So I have Madam L, uh, whom is actually eighty year old lady. Uh, with background history of hyperthyroidism, under, uh, underwent thyroidectomy long ago. Uh, she also had back, uh, she was diagnosed to have uh, left-sided ulcerative colitis since uh, 2006 in our neighboring country. Uh, she was given a long-term of prednisolone as she is not able to tolerate uh, thiopurines, mainly because of giddiness as well as nausea. So in 2016, she was being treated in another hospital in our neighboring country. And during that time, the treating physician uh, did a colonoscopy and found that she had Mayo 2 colitis at the rectal sigmoid uh, junction, as well as actually Mayo 1 colitis uh, at the ascending colon. So mainly this was actually a left-sided uh, colitis. Um, uh, several polyps were removed and fortunately the histological uh, grading was only low-grade dysplasia. Uh, she also had a uh, history of a Crocidium difficile infection and she was given a course of uh, oral vancomycin. So just to reiterate on the uh, Mayo classification, so as you can see Mayo 1 is mainly erythematous as well as loss of uh, vascular patterns, whereas uh, Mayo 2 mainly there's actually more predominant, um, uh, more marked uh, erythema with erosion and as well as loss of uh, vascular patterns. So I would like to pose the first question is that at this juncture, uh, what will you do? Uh, are you going to re-challenge the patient with uh, uh, exotalprin, uh, knowing that the disease is still not well controlled? Or are you going to actually uh, continue with a low-dose steroids that was actually being given by the previous uh, treated doctors? Um, you will start on uh, mesalazine alone, 2 gram maximum dose uh, twice a day. Or you will refer to a surgeon for total colectomy. Or you would like to discuss with the patient to start on uh, biologics. So please key in your answer and then we probably will discuss uh, further uh, uh, with the panel of experts that we have today. Uh, Professor Ran and Professor Ng, uh, I would like to invite you all to probably join the session as well and give me your talk as well after the polling session is closed. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Well, at this juncture, a majority of uh, delegates actually chosen. Perhaps it's time that we start on biologics. Well, is there any other things that we'll do? Uh, perhaps uh, we go through Professor Run first. So you know that this patient uh, still not well controlled, uh, but mainly actually on a low dose steroid all this while. Uh, so she's not on any immunomodulator. So what's your thought on this case? <laughs> Uh, perhaps uh, you need to un um, yeah. unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Alex, uh, for a very good case. This is, uh, you know, elderly uh, uh, female patients with long this cause of ulcerative colitis. And, uh, uh, you know, um, for this kind of elderly patients, and usually it's quite refractory uh, to, uh, you know, uh, immunosuppressions as well as uh, biologics. So uh, I think before we thinking about the, uh, the use of immunosuppressants or biologics, 
we uh, uh, just thinking, uh, ask ourselves uh, whether the patients are already optimized for conventional treatment. You know, the patients who is uh, hypertension. So I, I, I will not recommend it to you uh, uh, steroids in these patients. So a uh, rechallenge with enzocyprine is one of the uh, you know uh, uh, possible or potential candidates and optimize the five aminoacylates at the full dose or five. And, uh, uh, five uh, amino at a four gram per day we combine with uh, uh, topical treatment. As Sue has mentioned, uh, uh, this is a, a, a very a practical approach to treat uh, patients with, uh, you know, uh, um, arthritis not very quite severe. I'm not, you know, uh, um, um, uh, uh, suggest patients for elderly, uh, uh, 80 years old, to start for biologics. In our center, you know, if patients uh, older than 65, we will cautiously select patients with uh, 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 patients uh, we can buy uh, biologics to these patients or not. So, my my answer to this uh, at this stage is uh, optimize the uh, uh, five amino cells, perhaps with as a cyprine, if not, I, I mean, surgery is, is my next ch choice for, for elderly patients. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Ran. Uh, Sue, what's your thought on this? Uh, will you actually uh, challenge with azotalpine? Or, or if you want to challenge, how will you approach this uh, uh, lady that actually complained of very much uh, giddiness as well as nausea with uh, azotalpine? Right, so I'll just sort of comment um, a few things. The first thing that I wouldn't do is to maintain with low-dose steroids. If I were to use steroids, I would give high-dose and reduce. We see a lot of patients on 20 or 15 milligrams of steroids for a prolonged period of time. And I think that's basically a lot of winner. So definitely stop the steroids completely. In this case, if I have to use steroids, in fact, NMX bidacinide may be helpful. If it has a colonic release. So this is a multi-matrix uh, bidacinide that uh, has been shown in some patients who are refractory to mesalazine to help with less sided osteocolitis because of the formulation. So that's one option to try. Uh, to answer your question, um, we know that 50% of patients who are intolerant to thiopurine, if you change it to a different formulation, this has been shown actually in data. So in this case, you use isothiopurine. If you change it to metcarthopurine, interestingly, for the nausea, the sort of giddiness, it actually goes away in time. The other option is to half the dose and then we increase it or to reduce BD doses for a little while. So I do that quite a lot in my sort of clinical um, practice. So generally, I will optimize, I mean, I assume she's already had rectal and oral mesalazine, then I would maybe change the thiopurine or consider uh, methotrexate or um, MMX bidacinide in this case. I think four or five would be the next time step. So I'll give her a three months, so sort of, um, three to four months. If that doesn't work, then I'll go down to um, the biologics group. Yeah, so I, I think just to re reiterate what Professor Ran mentioned as well uh, regarding the risk of biologics, I think we are talking about infrasimab in elderly. Uh, we were certainly very, very much uh, anxious about starting biologics such as infrasimab or uh, NTTNF per se in this group of patients uh, because the risk of infection certainly is very high. And we do have uh, Professor Ida in our center. She does have a, a bit of uh, data on that to substantiate the claim that starting uh, NTTNF from elderly lady probably uh, elderly population, we need to be very, very carefully uh, scrutinized. Thanks very much for all the panel's uh, input. And so um, so we discussed, uh, the, the patient was being given the option of biologics, and of course, uh, she was uh, being referred uh, for uh, consideration of surgery as well, but she's not keen. So she was started by the treating physician with a metotrexate, uh, 25 milligram weekly with folic acid, and then mesalazine of 2 gram BD, which is an uh, optimal dose uh, since uh, 2016. She responded quite well initially, and uh, the stool count protecting, in fact, improved from uh, uh, more than 1,000 to uh, uh, to only uh, 695. So I would like to ask the panel expert over here, do you think that we should be uh, comfortable or, or complacent with the uh, reduction of this uh, fecal crop thing, knowing that what we have presented just now, the treat to target approach, and how do you interpret this cow protecting? Uh, will you be comfortable? So perhaps, uh, um, uh, Sue, you want to take this question first? Very short answer, no. 
because actually it's it's from October 2016 to February, it's over four months. So four months is a time where you really think about sort of change in therapy, so for another three months. So um, the copper pattern over a thousand is extremely high, which we know there's a lot of inflammation. I don't think you need to do all the school to have known that. And I think that's only less than half, less than 50%, the 695. So I think clearly, even with this treatment, she, it's not working, at least at this um, juncture. I think ask whether clinically she's well. So I suspect she falls into that 50% of patients who may be in clinical remission. But if you do an endoscope on her, uh, in her, you're going to see a lot of ulcerations and inflammation. So if she's quite elderly, we may need a drug that actually get her into both clinical and endoscopic remission a little bit quicker. Mm. What's your thought on the method? Is she using rectal okay. therapy? Is she re using rectal bile Because no. that she has distal disease, so I would have thought yes. if she just yes. flirt her, flirt her distal rectum with this, you know, bile ASA. It may actually, I use it round the clock sometimes for this sort okay. of cases. So will you choose? Uh, also because this is okay. So this is higher up because uh, this is going to be until the descending colon. So obviously we're going to use uh, uh, probably enema rather than suppository. Uh, but in your presentation just now, the data was mainly on uh, enema at the distal, uh, even actually for distal proprietis. So is there any different if you use a uh, uh, suppository for distal proprietis with, uh, rather than enema? Uh, because enema is more expensive in Malaysia. Uh, if she has rectal inflammation up to 15 centimeter, I would definitely go for suppository, so mesalazine or pentasa suppository. But if hers is up to descending sort of colon, actually, in fact, I would sometimes use suppository in the morning and enema at night. Then I know that that will target both um, the areas. Right. And this has been shown in scintigraphy studies to actually uh, go beyond. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, just going to come back on this. Uh, you mentioned about metotrexate as well. So, how what's your thought on metotrexate in the treatment of ulcerative colitis? So uh, we don't. I mean, we the, the one of the largest cohort is from UK. They did a lot of, sort of real life cohort to show that sort of um, metotrexate may have a, a role in patients ulcerative colitis. But it seems to work much better in Crohn's disease. And I presume she's using oral metotrexate as opposed to some kind. Yes. Uh, majority, the majority of the data in randomized control trial are from subcutaneous and IM data. So it could be that the bioavailability of oral may be a little bit suboptimal. Okay, all right. Professor Ran, do you have any thoughts on the fecal carprotectin and as well as what we have mentioned so far? Anything to add on? Yeah, in, in principle, I uh, agree with uh, Sue's opinion, but uh, you know, uh, it's quite interesting this elderly ladies uh, overseas. You know, less attractive treatment uh, uh, respond quite well initially. So um, actually, the role of uh, less attractive in uh, you know in the treatment of ulcerative colitis remains controversial. Um, in general, it was not recommended in the uh, uh, clinical setting, uh, but this is the case. It uh, respond quite well, and also in our center, fewer. You know, selected uh, uh, patients, they are quite refractory to, uh, you know, 5-MSLS uh, uh, and refractory to, you know, intolerance to uh, endocyprine. We will uh, prescribe uh, the uh, mesotraxate to, to them. Uh, some of them uh, respond quite well, uh, same as like, you know, this elder lady. And uh, so uh, it's just wondering, you know, uh, the, the actually the role of surgical uh, efficacy of methotrexity, the role of, you know, uh, given, uh, so it's still controversial. It's quite interesting this elderly uh, lady response quite fair. And the, yeah. protecting, the role of the uh, protecting, you know, it was not verified in Asia, um, Asian um, populations. So in clinical setting, we uh, still have to accumulate sufficient data to, to know the type of barrier of the, uh, uh, you know, which indicating uh, the re uh, remission or activity, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you for the inputs. So she had undergone uh, another repeated colonoscopy in March 2017. At that point in time, it did show a bit of improvement uh, from Mayo 2 now, actually Mayo 1 mainly from uh, extending from rectum sigmoid to descent. Uh, view is again is low grade dysplasia uh, with uh, uh, chronic colitis being observed. 
So she was referred uh, to a surgeon uh, if, uh, for uh, for surgery, but then she's not keen, and then she would like to opt for biologics. So she from Singapore, uh, she moved down to back to Malaysia because she's originally from Malaysia. Uh, she was referred to our center, University of Malaya Medical Center, for further care. And when she reached our center uh, in 2017. She's still complaining of uh, diarrhea about six to seven times a day. Uh, we attributed it to active disease and clinical uh, examination noted that she's uh, pale, uh, but there's no scleroid uterus, no lymph no palpable, abdomen was soft, non-tender. And she kept on asking the same question to me every time she see me. She said, why me? Because she always attributed it that the disease became more uncomfortable after a session of colonoscopy. And she actually said that because of colonoscopy, uh, it sort of like actually damages her colon. So there's always a misbelief in this patient that uh, she doesn't have anything uh, or doesn't have autoimmune disease, but mainly all are traumatic uh, 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 due to the repeated colonoscopy that being done to her. So she has some investigation done, uh, of which uh, TV spot tests were negative. So we are starting investigating her to prepare her for biologics. Uh, renal profile were normal. And surprisingly, we did a hepatitis B core antibody, and it was actually detected uh, positive. So I would just like to ask uh, the panel expert on uh, on the, the this uh, this uh, uh, sort so of like actually account uh, hep B infection, and do we need to be very alert about it, and how do we take approach on this uh, scenario? Perhaps, uh, Professor Ran, you can probably just give us your thought on this uh, core antibody of hepatitis B. It turns out to be positive. Um, so again, in this case, at this stage, in indicating uh, that a symptom is, uh, is not reliable, you know, indicate, uh, indicating uh, the index of uh, the severity. And some patients, the elder lady, uh, uh, you know, uh, complained it was uh, clinically okay, but uh, a second uh, endoscope had assumed there, there was still, you know, inflammation in the gut. So there was the, indeed, there was a discrepancy between the endoscopic finding and the clinical uh, indices. This is uh, true in clinical settings. So uh, for these patients, you know, for long course of disease, inflammation still, there was still uh, uh, inflammation exists and uh, how to control the information is of challenge because there's a low uh, uh, grade displeasure was was uh, detected. You know, uh, we can further uh, 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 follow up uh, and perform a surveillance colonoscopic to this lady uh, on one hand. On the other hand, the patient's uh, some investigations had found something abnormal, uh, such as uh, hepatitis uh, see antibody uh, detected, so it, it's okay if if the patients were not you know were not received in the suppressions or biologics, mm -hmm. you can just leave it you know just follow up. If patients you know uh, uh, intend to receive uh, in the suppressions and biologics, in this case is uh, mesotraxis what was taken. So I think uh, uh, antivirus, you know, uh, a treatment should be applied for these patients. Of course, there are some, uh, two different opinions. In Western countries, the guidelines suggest uh, a tight monitor every three months. But in China, you know, because uh, China is a uh, HPV uh, endemic region, we will prescribe uh, the antiviral treatment to those patients because the follow-up system was not, you know, good enough. Sometimes patients was will disappear for a long time and uh, when they back with abnormal liver function. So at this uh, stage, you can, you know, if you are you are confident about the follow-up, it's okay. You can just, you know, uh, mm. just uh, experiments, you, uh, you just check the uh, HPV DNA. If not, you know, uh, we will, in China, we will prescribe, uh, you know, anti uh, mm. HPV our okay. this patient. Hmm. See, will you do anything different, uh, knowing that this patient will have a core antibody that is positive? Uh, so, I mean, a cup happy is clearly very common in Asians. So, in this patient, uh, if you look at the sort of guidelines, the oncology field, if it's a high risk for reactivation, uh, although not as high as a chronic carrier, we would, you know, have a low threshold. Depending on patients, it's uh, self-hate on that, not, because some are reverse and some are not. It depends on the reverse policy. But if you're going to start biologics or steroid for long term, then definitely, um, yes. 
Would, would, it, would does it matter if what type of biologics you are choosing? Uh, for him, for instance, if uh, uh, anti TNF versus uh, anti green or anti IL twenty three, does it matter if uh, depending on which uh, type of biologics? I think we don't really have so much data on that. So you know, in, in uh, elderly ATO, if this is a prophylaxis that's going to save her from us over reactivation. Anti-TNF, definitely yes. I mean, because mm. that's where yeah. we have the information. I think for yeah. this, uh, if you looking, we probably take a record from the rheumatology in terms of the certain oh. amount of data, and some of them do, I mean, use that as well. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. So the next question I wanted to ask the audience is that would what would you do then? What option do you have? So I purposely phrased the question in such that I want you all to think about whether uh, anti-TNF versus actually other than anti-TNF. Uh, perhaps uh, we get the audience to choose their in, uh, thoughts and then we'll just uh, slightly as you mentioned this uh, in our discussion. Right, so I think everyone is uh, probably actually concerned that uh, in elderly, uh, probably anti-TNF would be very much uh, not suitable for this lady because of recent infection. Uh, so majority of people were chosen uh, other than uh, anti-TNF. I think we probably move on to the next question, unless there's anything to add on from the panel or expert. Uh, if not, probably we'll just move on to the next question, uh, to the, the next presentation. So by that time, uh, she's still complaining of diarrhea uh, when she's following up with her. Uh, she's still on methotrexate 25 mg per week uh, with uh, optimized uh, mesalazine. We already started discussing a biology option for this patient, uh, but unfortunately the family are very concerned, even though we repeatedly explained to them that Vedulizumab is the best choice for her. Uh, during that time, we don't have Ustokinumab yet, so this was actually in 2017. Uh, Vedulizumab just came into our, our, our country. So, um, but the family is still very concerned on the concept of biologic, so we were not able to prescribe for her. So. At the end of 2017, we did a scope. So you see from Mayo 2, Mayo 1, now we have very severe, in fact, pancolitis throughout the uh, the colon. And we can see that there's also a relative uh, inflammatory structure over here. Um, so what's your thoughts? Uh, perhaps you, what will you actually uh, uh, make up on this uh, case now? Because uh, it has certainly progressed so fast that the disease is still not under control. And how do we approach patients uh, fixated scared on this uh, biologics? Uh, looks bad, according to me, number one, and I presume you have excluded CMB, C. diff, because she clearly is prone to those two infections, and we sometimes get caught, you know, um, easily. Uh, if you have excluded all types of infection now, she even looks like she had, like, potential so much inflammation, like a structure, and she's at high risk of um, cancer and dysplasia, I mean, as well in this case. She needs uh, something that's quite rapid, because I presume that this finding and also with her, her she's also clearly quite symptomatic then and with mm -hmm. some yeah. stricture. So in this case, um, um, it, it, it would be, I mean, even with um, um, surgery is one option, of course. I mean, that's something that I would have not necessarily say she needs it now, but I would have had the people, you know, to talk to her a, about that already. With a time bounder, if in three months or a few months, even she's not responding to medical therapy, then that might be. Uh, I presume she's quite a good premorbid, uh, has good premorbid, yeah. so, because, because she said to you, why me? So she must be very well <laughs> before then. Um, and then that would be now looking at the use of a, a biological um, agent. Actually, um, I'm not sure why she's against the Luzuma because uh, it's. I think the family is. The, yeah, the family has been actually given the option of biologic spread in neighboring country. I think probably they, they did a bit of research and then they. They probably akin the, the or assume that venduzumab is the same as NDTNF with all the side effect profile that being highlighted. So the family is a bit concerned of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say either okay. it's an anti ATNF or um, a, a biological drug. I mean, at this junction, yeah. Of surgery. Yeah, Professor Ran, anything to add on at this junction? Yeah, uh, you know they are saying uh, save life, not saving uh, saving the colon. So uh, I agree with Sue's comments, and uh, first of all, to try to exclude. Uh, those potential, you know, infectious causes which aggravate the uh, uh, the uh, colitis, 
and for elder patients who are at 80 years old, and uh, this time the chronoscope showing the uh, structure of the colon. So uh, this is indeed is the indication for the surgery. Yeah. Because yeah. when uh, I just patients with structures, uh, proximal cancer could not ex uh, exclude it. So again, um, for uh, uh, of course you can well, uh, we can uh, choose some uh, relatively safe uh, uh, by uh, novel biologics such as uh, uh, video or with map to these patients because of relative uh, 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 safety profile. But uh, but my recommendation to this uh, uh, older lady was uh, to receive surgery. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so to address that, we did check for CMV colitis. We didn't check for clostridium difficile uh, infection. They were all negative, and we did offer the patient again consideration of surgery. But having to go through colonoscopy, that actually she thought that it aggravated the oh. disease. She definitely said no to surgery, and so to her, surgery is definitely not an option. So. So uh, perhaps I uh, just want to get the thoughts. If let's say this is a patient that presented to us now, uh, what would be your option, either considering vedolizumab or ustekinumab? Uh, perhaps I just want some thoughts from the audience. Uh, what will you choose at the, uh, at the moment? Wow, majority of people chosen uh, Any preference, uh, Professor Ron, uh, in your case, would you, how do you decide yeah. if you have any preference? Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, when you're deciding opposition to biologics, several, you know, uh, aspects should be take uh, uh, consideration. First of all, the rapidity of the, uh, uh, of the actions. Um, for those, uh, you know, medications such as antitin, uh, antitin, TNF, particularly infraximab, steroids, uh, cyclosporin, or tigerlimers, they act on several days. They act on days. But for the rest of uh, biologics, including uh, um, adalizumab, they uh, it take more than one week at least to start uh, to show some efficacy. For vitro and for escinimab, maybe at least weeks after uh, uh, after initiation of the medications, the therapeutical uh, uh, efficacy start to reach significance if you compare with control group. And uh, this is first the rapidity of the uh, um, action. And the second one is comparative, you know, efficacy. So far in a uh, uh, clinical trial, only one trial indicating uh, uh, the vitality map is superior than the adaptive map for inducing endoscopic remission, as you had mentioned during your talk. It's quite clear cut, you know, evidence. And the third one is the uh, the, the efficacy for those post operation prophylaxis. So mm -hmm. up to now, you antitinib works better, was uh, uh, much better than the the rest of the. Uh, 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 the biologics because those uh, biologics still accumulating the evidence for treating, uh, preventing uh, post uh, recurrence, you know, post surgery uh, recurrence. And the first one is the, to those the w uh, women, um, the safety for, for those. And so far, all the anti TNF was safe to uh, pregnant, uh, pregnant women. And uh, uh, because of uh, video and oscinumab, uh, had been approved and, uh, in recent years. Uh, we still uh, to accumulate the clinical evidence for uh, for the pregnancy, but so far the evidence too they are safe. And uh, the fifth one is the to you know uh, safety issue. According to our, our safety pyramid, the normal uh, biologics ranked top one. The top one is Vito, and the second one is Oskinomab. They are uh, you know. They are safer than the anti-TNA for either uh, monosurgery or by, uh, a combination surgery, and safer than opacinibar. Uh, and the last one is the uh, you know to systemic uh, effects such as actual in uh, intestinal manifestations. And uh, finally, of of course, the cost cost also uh, uh, play a role in deciding all those you know uh, decisions. So in this case. Obviously, 
bevacizumab uh, is the choice because high mucosal rate, uh, uh, healing rate has been observed in recent years. For uskinumab, it, it was approved only last November, so we still need to, uh, some data from real world. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ran, for that extensive insight on uh, this uh, question. Uh, anything to add on, Sue? If not, we will move on to the next uh, slides. Uh. Uh, my only um, comment is that, with the mark from my experience, if this patient is pretty sick and really symptomatic, it does take a little while to work. So I wouldn't yeah. completely exclude an anti-TNF in this scenario because, I mean, although safety is important, I mean, getting her into remission is even more important at this juncture. Okay, point taken. Thank you. So she was uh, uh, started on vedulizumab. Uh, eventually, uh, the first dose was started even actually about uh, four months later. Uh, during that four months uh, before we start uh, biologics, uh, she was still not well. Uh, so initially, we want to start in March, but she came down with some URTI. Hence, it was actually uh, uh, delayed. Uh, so during the time that we started on vedulizumab, we still continue with the metatracid. I guess I just have a practical question to ask the panel or expert. When will you consider stopping the metatracid in this patient? Uh, will you wait for the, 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 the disease to be more stable before we stop the metatracid? Or will you do a colonoscopy to confirm that mucosa healing has achieved? Uh, then only we stop the metatracid or you will stop quite early. So perhaps I can just get your point on that. Sue, maybe you, you want to actually address this issue. Yeah, sure. So the data on betalizumab shows that moral therapy is just as good a combination. So if this is a drug I'm using, I ask myself, why am I needing an immunomodulator? The usual case with immunomodulators is to reduce immunogenicity over time. So for anti-TNF, in this case, I probably don't think it's working. I would have just uh, stopped that actually if the betalizumab is, um, is working. Because combination therapy may even increase the risk of further infections in elderly patients. Yeah. Okay. Professor Ran, anything uh, to add on on this matter? Yeah. 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 Uh, we know that uh, uh, in Crohn's disease, the induction of mesotraxate um, at dose of 25 milligram per week is will be last only about uh, about four four months. But this lady uh, takes a longer time than you know than the uh, suggested. So at this time point, I think a stop uh, uh, mesotrax mesotraxid will be better to uh, to this uh, patients yeah all right thanks so we've been talking about uh, metotracid uh, so uh, i think we'll just move on to the next question uh, we're just not going to answer this um, so let me just ask uh, the audience would you keep mesalazine as part of the treatment uh, even though we started on uh, biologics the uh, vedulizumab for this patient can i just get the audience thought and then the panel expert probably can give their idea as well Okay, so let's see. So majority of people say yes, they would like to keep mesalazine as part of the immunomodulator, even though we started on vedulizumab. What's your thought on this, Professor Ran? Yeah, uh, in the case of anti-TNF, uh, it was controversial whether use combination therapy, combine use anti-TNF with mesalazine in uh, patients with arthritis patients. So until uh, last May, uh, last uh, uh, 2019, DDW, there was talk, uh, abstract showing that, the data showing that from the, the US uh, registry and uh, combination therapy with combined use anti-TNF with mesalazine did not add adaptive you know, effects to those patients. So it was not recommended uh, to those patients when they uh, receive anti-TNF uh, uh, treatment. So you can stop mesalazine because no additive effects could be observed. But uh, this case uh, uh, was quite different from the uh, uh, patients who receive anti-TNF because so far we don't have the evidence to show the when you combine use the uh, uh, anti integrin the video with mesalazine or uh, video uh, monotherapy. We don't have the data we can, you know, we can use mesalazine in this case, but we need uh, the data to support this, yeah. this 
yeah, combination therapy. Yeah. Thank you. Will you do any differently, uh, Professor Siu? Uh, I think I could also take this chance to address one of the comments that was in the um, panel. So someone posed a question about chemo prevention of 5 ASC. So I mean, I think if this young girl or this patient is fit and you know that lifespan, you want to use it for chemo prevention, it's slightly different to reduce uh, that part. So I probably would sort of, um, continue. But certainly, um, I think we don't have the data. So it, it's actually controversial about whether you continue um, or not. If the is is working, then I think it is completely fine. But for chemo prevention, then you can continue that. Okay, thanks, thank you. So uh, she responded well to Vedorzimab. Uh, so uh, uh, she's doing well even up to uh, six doses and seven doses of uh, Vedorzimab, clinically asymptomatic, and the inflammatory marker CRP is uh, 2.1, which is low. Uh, so, and then we actually continue the treatment until uh, the end of September. Uh, 2019, she started having diarrhea again. So this was actually after a, a year and a half later, uh, she started having uh, symptoms. And we did a colonoscopy. Gosh, this is a colonoscopy. So the disease suddenly actually became active again. And at this juncture, we did actually check for infection again. She is actually, uh, there's no evidence of uh, CME colitis. There's no evidence of costidin deficient infection. So what we did is that we started her on uh, budesonide. And uh, so I just want to get the thoughts of the audience again. What will you do now? So you can choose more than one answer. And then perhaps after this, we can just uh, uh, discuss further uh, what we can do for her. All right, Sue, what we have done for her? So oh, I think it's time, it's time to call up our friendly surgeon at this juncture. <laughs> uh, if the other option, while she is waiting to, uh, you know, of course there's a chance she may not, you know, um, want that, then the other option would be a, a different sort of biologic. In, in that case, it will be IO, you know, um, factory inhibitor. But I certainly would have a very low threshold for, for um, surgery, saying, okay. you know, the quality of life will be much improved. This has been going on for a little bit too long. <laughs> <for my time>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but again, yes, yeah, so she's very fixated that uh, she just doesn't want any surgery done on her. And the children are all very, very much anxious about it as well. It's really, really difficult to talk to them on the surgery part. Professor Ran, do you have anything to, uh, to offer at this, uh, uh, pertaining to what you're going to do now? Yeah, actually, before, uh, before I answer this question, I would like to say this patient because uh, with structures, uh, CT enterography should be performed uh, in the previous stage. So to exclude any potential risk of cor uh, correct cancer. So for, for, for me, you know, initially I already proposed for the elderly ladies, if refractory uh, to those conventional treatment, uh, which defined as 5-MSLSLs uh, and steroids, um, with, you know, a pain colitis, I, I would like to transfer this patient to surgery for colectomy because yeah, it's yeah. harmful for diverse, you know, uh, medications to these uh, patients. The patients will be put on the high risk to, uh, uh, second to the uh, infection. Again, I will uh, uh, emphasize on the saying, safe life, not save, saving the colon. This is the principle in clinical setting. Yeah, that's actually a very, very strong word there. Yeah, save life, not save the colon, correct. All right, so um, so she was started on beauty tonight. Clinically, she responded. Uh, then we actually stopped the treatment uh, in uh, around January, but sad to say that she came in another flare in February, and she was being started on the beauty tonight again, but this time now it doesn't work. So it was actually discussed with her for surgery, but she's... Definitely the family, everyone not keen for that. Uh, so without any option, we actually started her on Ustakinumab uh, uh, March this year. 
so this is actually the colonoscopy or simuloscopy before we start on uh, uh, on uh, uh, Worcester Kinomap. Uh, so basically, once we started, about two months later, uh, she is actually in clinical remission. Uh, so her weight is increasing, inflammatory marker has dropped. Uh, so the last we saw her was actually in September. Uh, she's already received a fourth dose of ustekinumab with maintenance dose of mesalazine uh, 4 gram per day. And so this is just to summarize, uh, in the interest of time, I would just like to summarize the case by saying that this is a progress over the years. So during the time that she'd have a flare, uh, even though she was on uh, 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 map, she had a sudden drop of weight. And then after we started her on uh, uh, Ustokinumab, you can see that uh, her weight increased. And another beauty of Ustokinumab is because uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, we can always deliver the drugs at home. Uh, so what she does is that the children will come to hospital to pick up the subcutaneous of Stokinumab and she got it actually done at the uh, home care and then uh, so the last uh, measurement of the weight is actually uh, pretty much well doing well. So with that I would just like to thank uh, Professor Ran and Professor Siu for actively participating in this uh, uh, case discussion. Um, so uh, I would just like to actually invite everyone to join our Malaysian Society of Gastroenterology uh, uh, annual meeting. This year we're going to do it as a virtual guard uh, uh, in November this year and then subsequently I would like to invite everyone to come to APW 2021 in Kuala Lumpur next year. Uh, with that I would just like to conclude. Uh, any things that you want to add on uh, Professor Ron or Professor Siu pertaining to this case? Yeah, no. Uh, thank you for your invite. That's, that's, great. that's, a, yeah. that's a great case. There's some questions <laughs> in the channel and we're happy to email or you know answer those. Um, yeah, I think we can still, if you don't mind, we can still take some uh, question okay. and then perhaps uh, we just extend a bit. Uh, I'm very apologize, apologize, uh, apologize for the uh, the uh, delay of this uh, session, but certainly I think we can take some question. Uh, uh, the first question I think being answered by Professor C already regarding the uh, uh, the uh, chemoprophylaxis, and uh, there was actually a question to Professor Run: Does the trick to target approach actually reduce the risk of neoplasm? or colonic neoplasm? Yeah, it takes time to accumulate, to obtain the data. So we have to, you know, emphasize the therapeutical goals is involving, you know, is uh, from, it will from uh, translation from endoscopic uh, remission to histological uh, uh, remissions. And for constitutes maybe transdural uh, 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 healings. So this, those are the ultimate goals uh, in clinic. Uh -huh. So there's there's also another question regarding the the beauty sonite. Uh, is it safe to be used as a long term uh, maintenance in ulcerative colitis? Perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, Sue, you want to answer the quest this question? So I think uh, there was two types of pedestalite. So there's the pedestalite which is enter. Yes, firstly, that has not been shown to work in toxicolitis, but more in small bowel Crohn's disease. But with the NMAX formula, uh, finasamide, which targets the colon, that has been shown to be uh, work very well with moderate to severe um, ulcer colitis. And generally, I think the systemic bioavailability is very low and doesn't affect so much your plasma cortisol. So certainly that could be used in some patients for a more prolonged period of time, a couple of months, than the standard uh, prednisolone that we generally use. Mm. Yeah, so there's another question on uh, do we have any dose modification for patients with chronic renal disease when using 5-ASA? Uh, anyone want to answer this question? Uh, any change in the dose uh, or dose modification for chronic renal disease? I'll be very careful actually because we know there's a small proportion of patients may get interstitial nephritis. It depends on how bad I mean, the chronic kidney um, disease I mean is. And I mean I think in this case certainly um, we'll probably um, either exclude use other options or lower sort of um, dose. Um, it, it, it also depends on the type. Is the patient on dialysis or how bad is the renal function? This generally in although very rare, we do monitor the kidney function every you know um, four to four to six months. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, I think this question is actually addressed to Professor Ron. Uh, so just during your presentation, you actually presented that uh, the intervention, the early intervention of NTTNF uh, was effective for Crohn's disease, but unfortunately it's not in the scenario of UC. Is there any explanation for this, Professor Ron? Yeah, because so far no clear definition for uh, or the early disease of in acerbital colitis. In animal models, the early uh, early disease uh, uh, and the later disease, they are different, you know, cytokine uh, expressions. And uh, usually uh, um, um, patients who receive uh, biologics, their disease severity is quite severe, you know. So that's one of the reasons why they fail uh, uh, by use the uh, antigenic intervention. Okay, all right. Well, uh, in the interest of time, uh, uh, I, I wish we can go on and then discuss further, but for in the interest of time, I probably we need to conclude the session already. And I'm sure that we are very grateful with Professor Ng, who actually walked us through the change in the uh, treatment of uh, histological remission and uh, the disease progression is able to actually change the disease uh, progression of the patient. And Professor Ran actually talked to us on the treat to target strategy and approach uh, of which the importance of closer healing has been highlighted repeatedly both by both uh, speakers. I'm sure we all agree that it has been a very fruitful meeting and I would like to take this opportunity to apologize for the technical breaches of the continuous beeping sound and I would like to thank uh, Faring Pharmaceutical, uh, Pharmaceutical for taking the initiative in uh, getting us all together uh, in this afternoon for this uh, very wonderful session and I would like to take this opportunity also to congratulate all the participants uh, for sharing your afternoon with us and till then stay safe and stay actually healthy uh, one day we hope to see you physically and hopefully next year APW 2021 in Kuala Lumpur I'll do that I'll pass over back to our uh, organizer uh, uh, pharmaceutical company uh, Ellen uh, perhaps uh, you can take over and thank you very much for having me as a chairperson thanks much for uh, for all your partic participation I think we are much indebted to our stellar speakers uh, Professor Xu Eng, uh, Professor Ran Zhihua, and also our fantastic, charismatic chairperson, Professor Alex Liao, uh, with his challenging and very insight, insightful case discussion. Uh, before we end this uh, session, I think we uh, also very hope that uh, uh, by uh, after this event, you will receive a survey of, uh, of this uh, webinar. Please help us to uh, improve our next uh, webinar session, and your feedback really does matter. So, all right, guys, uh, very, thank you very much to spend a, a wonderful uh, uh, one hour and 45 minutes with us and uh, as uh, Professor Alex Dale mentioned that take care of yourself stay safe until we meet next time have a good weekend thanks much thank you bye bye, thank you. bye, -bye. bye. bye, -bye.